is the count, dummy. In 2023, if you started to count 1-0, you hit like Julio Rodriguez. 0-1, you hit like Paul DeYoung. Can't tell the difference? Bam, watch this. 3-1, Ronald Acuna Jr., 2-2, Miles Straw. You think baseball's boring? It is a little boring, but every pitch matters. That's the point. There are 12 different counts in baseball, each more thrilling than the last. From the makers of 1-0, we bring you 1-1. And each of those counts comes with its own set of ridiculous stats going forward. Yeah, how about a 200 on base percentage for reaching 02 versus 739 for reaching 3-0? Looking at these, I'm reminded of an incident from 2022 in which Hall of Fame manager Tony La Russa intentionally walked Trey Turner to face Max Muncy, a reasonable decision with a lefty on the mound, except he only did it after Trey Turner reached a 1-2 count. And as good as he is, Trey Turner has a sub-600 OPS after a 1-2 count, while Max Muncy's OPS versus left-handed pitching is over 800. Then, the most obvious thing in the world happened, I won't even show it, I'm still so upset, and then, after he jogged across home plate, Muncy said, You freaking walk him with two strikes? Thank you, friend! Indeed, Trey Turner is a better two-strike hitter than most, but he can't escape the fact that the count is king. We've established that the first pitch of an at-bat matters insofar as the offensive talent gap between Paul DeYoung and Julio Rodriguez matters, so here's my question. Should you swing at the first pitch or not? And who is really in charge of that decision? Is it the batter? Is it the pitcher? Is it the catcher? Ooh, is it this guy? You know, they say the battle between pitcher and batter is like a chess match. I don't know much about chess, so when people ask me about chess, I just say, it's like a battle between a pitcher and batter. Also, there's a little horsey, and it can only L. Whether we're talking about the Magnus Effect or Magnus Carlsen, we know starting 0-1 in the count is key for the pitcher. These are the guys who did it most in 2023. Those first pitch strikes correlate strongly with a willingness to throw the fastball and a willingness to throw that fastball in the strike zone. The top two gentlemen, Max Scherzer and Jamison Tyone, tossed over 61% of their first pitches in the zone, but the results were different because hitters did well to swing at Tyone's first offering, not so much Scherzer's. Tyone might have reached 0-1 just as often, but it came at a cost. When the batter connected with his first pitch, they, well, they really connected. Here's a fact that isn't particularly interesting. Hitters around the league have figured out the optimal rate to swing at the first pitch. There's basically no difference in the result of at-bats that start with a first pitch swing, or take, over the last 10 seasons. And it wasn't always that way. In 1988, before you were born and your parents had fulfilling lives, hitters enjoyed a 24-point OPS boost from not swinging at the first pitch. Just to be clear, ending the at-bat on the first pitch, on average, produces excellent results, a 346 average and 596 slug across the board in 2023. But ending the AB requires hitting the ball in fair territory. If you foul it off or whiff, way to go genius, you're Paul DeYoung. You could have been a Julio, but now you're just Paul. Indeed, the batter risks more to swing at the first pitch than the pitcher does to throw a first pitch in the zone. Some batters are a little goofy with their first pitch swing decisions. Adam Duvall does it at an average rate, but he probably shouldn't considering the 80 points of OPS between swinging and taking across his career. Bryson Stott rarely swings at the first offering, but when he does, good gravy! Maybe he should do it more. And Luis Arias is also choosy, but he's not a first pitch masher. He bats 287 after he swings, but a whopping 336 for his career after he takes. So, let's say, for the sake of argument, a pitcher doesn't throw a first pitch in the strike zone, and the batter doesn't swing. This is known as a b- <sighs> Come on. A ball. With the count now one ball, no strikes, the chess match moves to the middle game. Had to Wikipedia that. The batter thinks, how do I keep my advantage? The pitcher thinks, how do I get my advantage back? And I think, what's going on at the bottom of the ocean? Seriously. Fact. If you're a hitter, it is good to swing at strikes and not swing at balls. But figuring out who is the best at that is trickier than you think. Salvador Perez swings at the 7th most pitches in the zone, good, but chases the most outside the zone, bad. 
And Jonathan India basically does the inverse by being passive in the zone. Maybe viewing pitches within the rigid framework of a binary ball strike system is constraining. Maybe it's more of a spectrum. Let's talk about Heart, Shadow, and Chase, which are not just the names of my guinea pigs, they're the names of three areas in and around the strike zone according to StatCast. As you can imagine, it's good for hitters to swing at pitches in the heart of the zone, and really bad to swing at pitches so far outside that they'd be chasing. But I want to talk about the shadow of the zone, because it's the only area where batters lose runs by swinging and taking. They just mitigate the damage by doing the latter. In fact, only two hitters have gotten positive results from swinging at pitches close to the borders of the strike zone since 2020. Their names are Jordan and Freddy. You're probably familiar with their work. Everyone else is better off not swinging at those pitches. When ahead in the count, the personal zone of pitches to swing at needs to be constrained to the heart. Swings in the shadow zone are typically either swings and misses, which are strikes, foul balls, which are also strikes, or weak contact in play, which is usually an out. The average batted ball in the heart of the zone was hit 92.9 miles per hour last year. That's Julio, again. In the shadow zone, only 86.3. That's Miles Straw, again. So, in counts where the hitter is ahead, let's say 1-0, 2-0, 2-1, or 3-1, who did the best at swinging at pitches in the heart, but not the shadow? Despite everything, it's still Mike Trout, baby. He swung at 81% of pitches in the heart and only 38% of pitches in the shadow in those situations. Keep in mind, 19% of shadowed pitches in the zone are incorrectly called a ball. So, if you take a borderline strike, Blue might still give it to you. Aaron Nola lurks in the shadows, like some sort of pitching ninja. Since 2020, all four of his pitch offerings have been in the shadow zone at a higher rate than league average. And given that shadowed pitches produce extremely negative outcomes for hitters who swing and slightly negative outcomes for hitters who take, anything in that location is a win for the pitcher. There's a perfectly even split between plate appearances that end with the pitcher ahead, on an even count, and with the batter ahead, yet the outcomes are anything but. Pitchers allow a miserable 971 OPS when behind in the count, a perfectly average 733 OPS when a matchup ends on an even count, and a minuscule 528 opposing OPS when finishing ahead in the count. So, who wins the plate appearance with a count advantage most often? Among starters since 2020, it's these guys. Who finishes with the advantage least often? That would be these jokers. Unsurprisingly, the former group has fared much better in terms of ERA than the latter. But some pitchers can still excel without that count advantage. Look no further than Kodai Senga of the Mets. In his MLB debut in 2023, he mitigated damage in batter advantaged mid counts like 1 0, 2 0, and 2 1 better than anybody. The key was using his cutter as an out pitch, meaning I just want out of this at bat because it's not going great for me. And it worked. Senga ended 75 at bats in those counts and hitters slugged under 300 against the cutter when they should have had the advantage. They put the ball in play while up in the count, but the contact quality was poor. 56% of those batted balls were ground balls, many softly hit. In those counts, Senga threw the cutter 47% of the time, compared to 19% for all others. He beats the expectations of the count, but he's also so beholden to it that he completely changes his pitch mix. Hey, way to go, pitcher! You just reached two strikes in the count. If your name is Josh Hader or Spencer Strider, you do this over two-thirds of the time. Now you just need to finish the job. Believe it or not, reaching two strikes and getting the strike out can be two separate skills. Take a look at the numbers for Bailey Ober. Bailey, what kind of name is that for a boy? And his former Twins teammate, Sonny Gray. Sonny Gray sounds like a pitcher from the 1920s, not the 2020s. Ober reaches a two-strike count at a higher rate thanks to his fastball, but lacks a true put-away pitch. You can coax strike one and strike two on foul balls, but not strike three. Sonny Gray, meanwhile, finishes the job more often thanks to his sweeper, leading to a higher overall strikeout rate. For a pitcher who gets to two strikes and finishes the job, look no further than Kevin Gosman. Since his reinvention with the Giants in 2020, his splitter has recorded more strikeouts than any other pitch in the league. And he throws it 52% of the time in two strike counts compared to just 28% in non two strike counts. Again, the count is dictating pitch usage, and Gosman has a devastating put away pitch. 
Of course, hitters can change their approach with two strikes as well. In many ways, the art of hitting is figuring out the right mix of contact quantity and contact quality. Some like to take their big daddy hacks early, but focus on simply putting bat to ball with two strikes, like I did when I had a 25% contact rate in Appalachian League play last year. But don't take it from me, take it from Glaber Torres. Here are two home runs hit by Glaber Torres in 2023. Notice anything different about the swings? The one on the right, which was hit with two strikes, eliminates the big leg kick. In making this adjustment, Torres made more contact on two strikes than in non-two strike counts, boasting the highest differential between those situations in the league. He correspondingly dropped his strikeout rate and collected 22 more two strike hits than in 2022. He had to sacrifice power in those two strike counts to do it, but it was a worthwhile sacrifice. I've always been interested in swings on 3-0 pitches, and I'm not talking about relitigating that Fernando Tatis Jr. slam when the Padres were already up big. I'm talking about the decision to swing or not swing outside of the unwritten rules. There is a baseball playing robot by the name of DJ LeMahieu who usually sticks to his programming. He's seen 289 3-0 pitches in his 13-year career, and he swung at just two of them. The first was in 2013, he fouled off a pitch in the zone, so no harm. And the second was six years later in 2019 when his programming temporarily malfunctioned and he singled to score a run, giving him a crispy 2000 career OPS in 3-0 counts. Because hitters have a 1200 OPS after reaching a 3-0 count, one might say that balls in play need to do better than that, but what if the swing results in a strike? Well, the count moves to 3-1, which is still a hitter's count, albeit a worse one than 3-0. We'll look at this conundrum in terms of WOBA, weighted on base average, which condenses the triple slash of average on base and slug into one number. You can think of it as OPS, but for even more annoying people. 31% of 3-0 non-swings result in a walk, while the other 69% result in a called strike. A walk is worth 694 WOBA, and a 3-1 count is worth a 478 WOBA moving forward, meaning a non-swing in 3-0 generates a 545 WOBA. Now, if you do swing, 55% of those swings are put in play, and the corresponding batted balls are generally hit well, with a 478 WOBA on contact, aka, Whoa, Bacon, said the cowboy in the Old West. The horse's name was Bacon. But wait, we've seen that number already. The other 45% of swings resulted in a strike via a whiff for a foul ball, and as we know, a 3-1 count moving forward is also worth exactly a 478 WOBA? It's the same number. So swinging on 3-0 on average is worse, but whether you actually put the ball in play on 3-0 on average makes no difference once you've made the decision to swing. Theoretically, you'd have to wallop 3-0 pitches at a 600 woe bacon to break even, and only four aggressive 3-0 swingers in the pitch tracking era have managed to do that. But there's theory and there's practice. Think about DJ LeMayhew's rinky-dink single. Stat nerds will tell you that a walk is as good as a hit, but stat jocks like myself will tell you, not when there's a runner in scoring position and first base is empty, that guy can't score on a walk. Going off the run expectancy matrix, a single in LeMayhew's situation carries over twice the value of a walk. You know who understands that? Carlos Santana. He's taken the 23rd most 3-0 swings overall, but second most swings in optimal situations in the pitch tracking era. All four of his hits on a 3-0 count have come in spots where a hit is far superior to a walk. Now let's talk about 3-0 from a pitcher perspective. Here's a number. Christian Javier strikes out 15.8% of batters he faces after going down 3-0 in the count. That's comparable to Bob Feller's entire career. No hitter understands this better than Nathaniel Lowe of the Rangers. He's been up 3-0 in the count versus Javier four times. The results of those at bats, three strikeouts and a lineout. Javier always escaped by spamming three four-seam fastballs at him. The biggest, baddest boy of them all. 3-2, aka full count. It's a two-strike count, but it's also a three-ball count, which means it's technically in the hitter's favor. It's probably hard to make heads or tails of this low average, high on base percentage slash, but Woba tells us it's well above the 318 baseline. 
One key advantage for the hitter is that the walk rate on full count is a smidge higher than the strikeout rate. League-wide, pitchers throw 57% of their full count pitches in the zone versus 49% in all other counts, a 16% increase over baseline. But batters? Batters swing at 70% of full count pitches versus just 46% in other counts, a whopping 52% increase. So hitters clearly feel more pressure to up their swing rate than pitchers do to up their zone rate. Why is that? Psychologically, as a batter, getting rung up on a called strike three makes you feel like a real chotch. There's no way around it. Even if you chase a pitch outside the zone, you might be able to foul it off and live to fight another day. You don't live another day if you let a strike go right past you. You just feel like a total chotch. There are multiple ways to excel in full counts as a hitter. Just examining the top active players on 3-2 counts, we see Joey Votto expertly drawing walks with a ridiculous 546 on base percentage and 39% walk rate. He does this by not chasing pitches outside the zone. Jose Ramirez has a completely different approach. He's swinging at everything, and that means chasing everything. But his contact skills are so good, he usually just fouls off the bad pitches to hit and crushes the good ones. Either way, he prioritizes damage. But the top full count hitter by OPS, Will Smith, can do it all. He swings at pitches in the zone at a high rate, chases at a low rate, and homers approximately every 15 full count at bats. So for batters, it's simple. Swing at strikes, don't swing at balls, but get this. The pitchers are allowed to trick you. They throw pitches that look like they're gonna be balls, but then they're strikes, and then they throw pitches that look like they're gonna be in the zone, but then they're not. I could play in the big leagues today if pitchers weren't allowed to trick me. In terms of strikeouts and walks, perhaps the greatest full count bamboozler is Edwin Diaz, who boasts a 47% strikeout rate and 28% walk rate in those spots. And he does this without actually filling up the zone. Less than half of his full count pitches are in the strike zone, but he gets so many out of zone chases that batters have a negative run value even when he throws a would-be ball. Indeed, sometimes a great full count pitch isn't even in the strike zone. Shohei Otani proved that with his decisive sweeper to Mike Trout in the World Baseball Classic Final last year. In conclusion, the count is important and you should yell at umpires whenever they mess up, blah 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 blah. There's really one more thing worth mentioning here, and that's the 3-1 count. Because it's the most exciting count in terms of damage. Hitters are hunting extra bases. By WOBA, again that's OPS for annoying people, the worst hitters after a 3-1 count in the league are still effective because that count carries such an advantage. Meanwhile, the best hitters when the count reaches 0-2, Quan, Arias, Betts, Trout, and Tatis, are good relative to other hitters in that dire situation, but they still aren't good. They're still well below the league average hitter in a neutral count. And that's why it's the only thing that matters, because in Major League Baseball there's no such thing as a bad 3-1 hitter or a good 0-2 hitter. There is nothing that can make Mookie Betts bad, except for, well, a bad count. Thank you to my newest patrons for supporting me over the offseason. To see your name here, head over to patreon.com slash foolishbaseball. Also, thank you to Maxo for the music. 